for your love we thank you for your grace we thank you for your mercy lord we thank you for the very air we breathe and lord as we take a few moments here to worship you to honor you as god to say thank you so much for blessing us beyond measure for so much more than we could ever imagine ever think holy spirit i ask that you just meet with us today that you give us a triple portion of the Holy Spirit, Lord, that we know that we are standing in the very presence of God, that we are here for your glory and not for yours. Lord, we thank you for all you've done. It's your name we pray, amen.
consuming burning fire glorious one
you feeling them today? Because I am feeling them right now here. Soak them up, people. now. <laughs> Welcome to church, everybody. Kind of reminds me of the Pied Piper. There goes Diane and all the kids with her. Whew. Yes, sir. Thank you, Ed. <laughs> Is it the what? For what? Oh. All right, yes, it's the Holy Spirit, right? I mean... Okay, who here decided to wake up and come to church? Because I told them to. Who, just, who here woke up and decided to come to church? Because I told them to. Nobody, right? Because who, 
What's that? I, I did. I did text Bruce. I said Bruce needs to come and set up for potluck. So yes, Bruce is here because I told him to. Everybody else is here because the Holy Spirit wants you here, right? The Holy Spirit is here in this building. He's here amongst us. He is. I don't know what he's doing, but he's doing something fantastic. And we thank him every day for that. So as we devote to 242, as we devote to 242, building the community of believers is a part of that. Right? Now when I say devote to 242, this is what I mean is Acts 242. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. These are the four things that the New Testament church did right after the day of Pentecost. And when they devoted themselves to these four things, who built the church? God built the church. The Holy Spirit built it. Christ himself built his church. And all they did is church. They did the things they were supposed to do, and God brought everybody in. So if you look around... Um, those of you that are familiar with our building are going to see some strange things happening. I know, it's not super strange, but the Holly Area Resource, the Holly Area Veterans Resource Center. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. They are being kicked out of Carl Richter along with everybody else, right? It's not that they're picking on the Veteran Center. Literally, they're destroying Carl Richter. They're going to build a brand new school. So there's a couple of organizations that use Carl Richter campus, and throughout the time that they've been talking about taking the campus down, I've had a couple of different organizations approach us. The Veterans Center is the ones that just are here going to be here. Um, they're going to be using the place. You probably won't even see them or interact with them unless you're here during the week. Um, if you notice, our library is locked. It's closed. That's Katrina's office. We've got some things in there that need to remain private, so I gave her a spot where she could do that. The conference room will be a shared space. So you may walk in there and see some of their stuff. That's okay. Just leave it there, right? I just ask everything to be cleaned up when they leave. Because it is going to be a multi-purpose room used by different organizations. Right? Saturday night, the refuge is a, is a completely different congregation that uses this building to have their services in on Saturday. Whose building is this? It's God's building, right? It's not our building. So the fact that people are flowing through this building is awesome, right? Some of the, some of the vets will never walk into a church otherwise. They'll walk into a church, right? And it, it just, it's, it's a good thing. I thank you for allowing us to do that. You're welcome. And the Carpenter's Church, Carpenter's Church has a spring concert next Saturday at 7 p.m. at Holly Calvary. So as we get churches working together like they're supposed to, and not building our walls up, right? Here we have a church using a different church to have their event. And that's fantastic. I would love if all 15 or 16 or 17 or how many churches are in Holly today would do the same thing. That's my prayer, that we start breaking down walls and let the main thing be the main thing. Right? Jesus is the main thing. That's why we're here. That is exactly why we're here. So if you, if you like to support them just by going and listening to concert music, go. It's at Holly Calvary at 7 p.m. And then also on May 11th at 9 a.m. to noon, Ed Coleman is going to have a spring work day. <laughs> I gave it all to Ed. We're going to put it all on Ed. So there, there are things that need to be done around the church. Obviously, right? You go outside the church, you walk around the church, and just like everyone else's house, who has things they have to do to their house? Clean windows, clean up the yard, right? We have things that need to be done. So we're going to develop a list. Uh, if not today, Ed, Monday, you and I should develop a list of a couple of the big things that we're going to hit. And I'll send out a text to everybody. So those of you that are, on, are not on my texting service, if you want to be on it, let me know. I'll just get your number, be on there. And 
I send out a, maybe like one text a week, sometimes two. And the text goes out, it's a 99,000 number, it goes out to everybody. And when you respond back to that number, you're talking only to me. Right? I may send it out to everybody, but anything that t- takes place after that is a one-on-one conversation. So different events, things like spring cleaning or spring dance or potluck on Sunday would show up on those texts. Kind of help us remind us what's going on because there are a lot of things going on. And I can tell you what, I forget most of the things that are going on unless I have my phone telling me what's going on. Who's in the same boat? Yeah. The great thing is we get to eat after church. Yes. I did see that. I did see that. And that's what we should have. Um, If you notice our sign, our sign has some pretty flowers in it now. Bushes. So we thank you, Laura, for doing that for us. And anyone else that's a part of this community to help keep the front of the church looking fantastic. I am not the guy that's going to go out there and make it look fantastic. That's not my gift. Right? And we each, we each have gifts, and that's exactly what the church is supposed to be. Right? And if we all use the gifts that we have, like Bruce. Bruce has a gift of setting that gym up. So I texted him and said, hey, Bruce, we need your help. Come, come set the gym up. And so he's here. Now, we also have Community Unite. Community Unite is the three churches that are working together to try and work together for the good of the community. We started something... Um, Senior lunches. We have senior lunches about once a month. And it, it's either here, typically, or at Holly Calvary. It's usually Carpenter's Church, Holly Naz, or Holly Calvary that is putting the, the dinner on itself, the lunch on itself. And in May, not the 11th, the 18th, May 18th, we're all busy. There's still going to be a senior lunch. And this church is busy. We got something going on on the 18th. Someone already reserved it. Holly Calvary is busy. So they got something going on over there. But the American Legion has opened their doors so we can have this senior lunch. So the senior lunch will still be going on, but it'll be at the American Legion. It will be actually hosted by Community Unite. So it's not just one specific church. It'll be those that are involved in the committee itself will be putting on the lunch. I may need a little bit of help from one or two of you, and I'll let you know. Also, one of the things that Community Unite does, yeah, that's fine. One of the things that Community Unite also does is they've started a third time slot for the food pantry over at Holly Calvary. As such, we get to be a part of that by donating food. And what you see up there is just a small list of the foods that they need. So when you go grocery shopping, you go to buy a box of cereal, buy a second box of cereal, bring it in, we have a bin under there, underneath the uh, table. Throw it in the bin. Maybe there for a week, maybe two tops, and then we'll take it over to Holly Calvary and add it to their food pantry. That is one way we can participate without creating a whole food pantry here. Because it wouldn't make sense to create a food pantry here, would it? No, we have food pantries. Can we be a part of those ministries? Absolutely. And that's being a part of the whole church. That's the whole church. Again, working together as a church. Ed? As we take a few moments to, to give back to God, remember, when, when you give in the offering plate, who are you giving it to? You're giving it to him, right? And, and that's the thing. Is he says, hey, give a little bit back. Be joyful when you do. And do it as an act of worship. Say, Lord, thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for the very air that I breathe, the thoughts in my head, the fact that I get to choose you or not choose you. We can't even begin to imagine how many ways he's blessed us. When we give a little bit back, just say, thank you, Lord. It's his money. Yeah, that's the thing. It's all his, right? I'm I'm thankful he lets me keep what I keep. But the thing is, when we're faithful, he is beyond faithful. He does amazing things. 
And some of the things that he's done for this building, where our treasurer comes to me and goes, Dan, <laughs> we're running a little short. And I go, okay, Ed, Lord. And Ed comes to me and goes, man, God is good. All the time, right? Father, we thank you for your love, for your grace, and your mercy. And Lord, we thank you that you more than provide for our needs. Lord, corporately, individually, you will more than provide for our needs. But you do ask that we be faithful and give back to you and to do so with a joyful heart. And Lord, as we take a moment, few moments to give back to you, just let us do it as an act of worship. To say, Lord, I'm, I'm just giving a little bit back to thank you for all that you've done. To thank you for the fact that you, you are so amazing and that you love me so much. In your name we pray, amen. So as part of devoting the 242, one of the things that we do is we pray for one another. And I've been asking you to pray Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. And when you pray Ephesians 3, 14 through 21, you pray scripture for somebody by name. Does God answer prayer? Yes. Absolutely. When it's within the will of God, God will 100% answer prayer. So if we're praying scripture into somebody's life, do you think God will answer that prayer? Absolutely, and he does. When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and I pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. And Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down deep into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it's too great to fully understand. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. So the general practice... We pray for one person every Sunday. Katie? We're going to pray for Katie. We're going to pray that from God's glorious omelet and resource, he will empower you with inner strength, that all your anxiousness will go away. Father, Lord, we thank you Lord, we lift up Katie to you. Lord, we place her before you. And, and Father, I'm just asking from your glorious unlimited resources, Lord, that you will empower her with inner strength, Lord, that you will just give her so much confidence and power to, to just continue to go through. And Lord, I'm asking that you take all the anxiousness away. Lord, that you just give her the peace of mind that transcends all understanding. Lord, that you just allow her total peace that you are on on her and in her and lord that her and her baby are perfect yes lord that she will be everything that she needs to be to be an awesome mother to this baby lord i'm just asking that you give her pure joy when she wakes up in the morning and she thinks of the awesomeness of being a mother that you give her pure, utter joy, complete peace, and let her know that you are with her every single step of the way. Lord, let her experience your love like she'd never experienced it before. Holy Spirit, just flow through her. Empower her. Let her know that she is loved beyond comparison, and that she is super precious in your sight, and that she is awesome, and that her baby is awesome, and that you'll be with her. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. You're welcome.
we have a new toy, folks. Give me a second. New technology, it's not working. I know, it's awesome when it does, but now it's not working. Okay, that's fine. There it is. It is the way. It is the way. We are all on a journey, aren't we? Every single one of us as believers are on a journey to grow and become like Christ. He wants us to be like him. Right, we're here, we're in church, and hopefully, hopefully we're figuring it out together. We're trying to get to where we need to be. Now, the thing is, is there's a handful of churches out there. I even spoke about it earlier today. How many churches are in Holly? A lot of churches are in Holly, right? And there's different theological backgrounds in each one of these churches. I grew up in the church, spent my entire life within the church. When I first grew up, I was Lutheran. And we were the, the, the Lutherans that, sh- that decided to go to church on Christmas and Easter. Right? That, that, that's, we, that's, that's what we were. At, at, at our master Lutheran, my parents went there like, you might get us there a third time, a fourth time. And then for some reason, when I was, I don't know, six or seven years old, they decided to move from one Lutheran church to the next Lutheran church. They became devout Lutherans. They were there every Sunday. So I know how a Lutheran service works. And even when I get into Lutheran service now and they start to recite all the creeds, it, you know, I was only in Lutheran church when I was like 12, but I can still recite the creeds from memory because of those rituals that the Lutheran church had. We went from being Lutherans to being Pentecostals. Anyone know what like, like a Pentecostals are? Right? So yeah, you go from a Lutheran to being a Pentecostal, they're a little bit different. Right? You go from almost from one extreme to the next. And <laughs> so we were Pentecostals. I was Pentecostal, and you know, I was in the Pentecostal church probably for most of my life. And I decided to leave the Pentecostal church, become a Nazarene. Nazarene speed is my speed. <laughs> yeah. I like it. Right? It's, it's, that, it's that middle of the road that I, I really like to be at. And but I've seen the different theological backgrounds. And I've been exposed to all of them. And believe it or not, that's a good thing. Right? However, however, that can also be an issue. Because we have all these ways, all these ways of going. And the question is, do all these ways, do they lead to Christ? And how do they lead to Christ? Are they leading to ritualistic, religious ritualism? Or are they leading to Christ? They can lead there, but sometimes they don't. It doesn't matter what church you're in. It doesn't matter what theological background you come from. Every single church has religious, ritualistic things that they do. Is that okay? Absolutely. As long as they lead where? To Christ. So in this building, I suspect we have a full background. We have Catholics, Lutherans, we have some Pentecostals, we have some Protestants, we have some Presbyterians, we have some that have been to independent churches that don't want to put themselves in any category. Exactly. I'm not, I don't belong to them. They're not really Christians. That's not the way we're supposed to look at it, right? We should be looking at it as we have things that we do within the church, that are religious. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's bad. Now let's turn to 2 Corinthians 3. 2 Corinthians 3, 1 through 18. Now, Paul is writing to the Corinthian church here. And one of the things that Paul is doing and Paul has to do, unfortunately, is he has to fight preachers and teachers who are teaching strict adherence to the law of Moses. You can't be saved unless you do all the rituals that you need to do to be saved. 
So Paul is fighting that in the Corinthian church just a couple years ago. And here we are a few years later. Are we still fighting the same thing? Yeah, we still fight religious ritualism versus the relationship. Again, there's nothing wrong with ritual at all. There's nothing at all wrong with religious rituals. When I'm preaching today, if I say that, correct me. There's nothing wrong with our traditions. Every church has them. We have them. Right? Ritual number one, we start at what time? 10 o'clock on Sunday morning, right? It's a ritual, though. It is. We sing how many songs? Four, Four songs, right? What happens if I sing five? Oh, <gasps> oh right? We can't do that. Woo, wait a minute, right? But as long as it all leads to Christ, our traditions are good as long as they don't trump leading us to Christ. And, and that's what the teachers here are, are, are battling against. As as, as Paul's battling against teachers that want to lead to rituals over the relationship. So 2 Corinthians 3. Let's start at verse 1. Now Paul here, I want you to understand, is speaking about his ministry. He's having to defend himself. He says, are we beginning to praise ourselves again? Are we like others who need to, to bring you letters of recommendation or who ask you to write such letters on their behalf? Surely not. The only letter of recommendation we need is you yourselves. Your lives are a letter written on our hearts. Everyone can read it and we recognize our good work among you. Clearly, you are a letter from Christ showing the result of our ministry among you. This letter is not written with pen and ink, but with the spirit of the living God. It is carved not on tablets of stone, but on human hearts. Who calls somebody into the ministry? God calls somebody into the ministry. Right? And when Paul is out there doing his missionary journey, God called him. Obviously, God called him, right? On the, on the road to Damascus, God changed his heart. And now he's out there and he's preaching. And there are other people coming and saying, hey, I'm going to preach to you as well. Here's my letter of recommendation. Liz, here are my degrees. I'm a pastor because I went to seminary. Does that really make me a pastor? No. Don't get me wrong. Again, education is good. Right? Education makes me a better pastor. Education makes you a better leader. Education can help you learn truth better, to present it better. But does that, in and of itself, qualify me to be a pastor? No. But people came with their letters of recommendation and said, Hey, I got my letter of recommendation, and I'm going to teach you. I'm going to teach you that you have to follow the law of Moses. Ed, you have to follow all 613 laws. And then, if you don't follow the extra additional 6,000 that we put on top of that, you're not really a believer. You laugh, but that's what the Pharisees, Sadducees, the, the religious groups did, is they put on other laws on top of the, just the 613. And then so they put roadblocks on top of roadblocks on top of roadblocks and say, okay, if you break this law, you're breaking the law. But it, that's, not even, that's not even the case. That's what they're teaching. They're teaching that. And Paul is trying to say, no, no, no. Verse 4, we are confident of all this because of our great trust in God through Christ. It's not that we think we're qualified to do anything on our own. Our qualifications come from God. He has enabled us to be ministers of his new covenant. This is a covenant not written, not of written laws, but of the Spirit. The old covenant ends in death, but under the new covenant, the Spirit gives life. So the Old Covenant, what is the Old Covenant? It is the Law of Moses. And what does it bring? It brings death, it brings condemnation. I know, right? And it, so a strict adherence to the Law of Moses 
is not where God ultimately has us with this new covenant. The new covenant is given by the Spirit, and it gives life. Verse 7, the old way, with laws etched in stone, led to death. Get this, though. It led to death, though it began with such glory that the people of Israel could not bear to look at Moses' face. So the law, given by God, is holy. It's glorious. Moses is up there. He's got his iPad out. <laughs> with his hammer, chisel on the law, right? And he brings it down. And his face shines because he's just been in the presence of God. There's so much glory on him that the people of Israel cannot even look at him. So he has to put a veil over his face. And this is the law that brought death. So much glory that they couldn't look at him. So the law is glorious. The first covenant was good. Don't ever think that the first covenant is bad. It's good. We need the first covenant to get to the new covenant. Verse 8. Shouldn't we expect far greater glory under the new way, now that the Holy Spirit is giving life? If the old way, which brings condemnation, was glorious... How much more glorious is the new way, which makes us right with God? The new way that makes us right with God. Why are you right with God? Through Jesus, through the new covenant. Those that were here last week, are you holy? Those of you here this week and didn't hear last week's sermon, are you holy? Yes. Why are you holy, Jared? Because of Jesus Christ. You are pure and holy. He made you pure and holy. Right? So when God says... I, I'm making you right. Is it through strict adherence to the law? No, it's through faith in Christ. We're given life. We're given an abundant life when we fully understand that I'm made right with God through Christ and Christ alone, not through obedience to the law. In fact, that first glory was not glorious at all compared with the overwhelming glory of the new way. So the law was glorious, but yet compared to the new way, it shines super dim. How blessed are we that we're under the new covenant? That is so, that's what we talk about in Ephesians, this glorious, glorious unlimited resources, right? How awesome it is that God can make us right with him. So if the old way, which has been replaced, was glorious, the old way has been replaced with glorious, how much more glorious is the new which remains forever? How fantastic and awesome it is that God has made me pure and holy just because of my faith in him. But whenever, sorry, verse 12. Since this new way gives us such confidence, we can be very bold. We're not like Moses who had put a veil over his face so the people of Israel would not see the glory, even though it was destined to fade away. But the people's minds were hardened. To this day, whenever the Old Covenant is being read, the same veil covers their minds so they cannot understand the truth. Let me read that again. But the people's minds were hardened, and to this day, whenever the Old Covenant is being read, the same veil covers their minds so they cannot understand the truth. Those that are not in Christ have a veil over their minds. Whenever I take this, not just the old law, whenever I take this and read this to somebody who's not in Christ, can they understand it? No. They cannot understand this. I cannot take scripture and use scripture to correct somebody who has not even come to Christ yet. They're not going to understand it. Maybe they'll be convicted when I, you know, there's a chance. But I don't expect an unbeliever to fully understand the word. Until they become a believer. That's what Paul says here. And this veil can be removed only by believing in Christ. Yes, even today when they read Moses' writings, their hearts are covered with that veil, so they do not understand. It is through Christ, through the Holy Spirit, who opens Scripture up to us. It's not through my understanding alone. I need the Holy Spirit with me when I read this. And when we read this, how many minutes a day, folks? 
Seven minutes a day of reading scripture will change your life forever. Sit down. Don't expect anything out of it. Lord, here I am. I'm going to read it. Read it, and the veil will be lifted because you believe in Christ. And whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is freedom. I talked about religious ritualism. Some people don't find any freedom in religious traditions. Some people do. Like I said, our traditions are not bad. Nothing wrong with church tradition. Sometimes we have to understand what the tradition is versus what the word says, though. We have to be able to split the two. Because trust me, people on this side of the church may not want the same tradition as people on this side of the church. Ed's upset at me because I didn't sing five songs versus you guys that only want the four songs. You, you laugh, but you know what? Stuff like that splits churches. Oh, my gosh, really? Stuff like that will split a church. Something that's not even biblical will split a church. That's, that's outrageous to me. So all of us who have so all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. So if, if you're a believer, what does it take to be a believer? Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, you're saved. You're a believer. Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart. It's that simple. You're a believer in Jesus Christ. You're saved. That's it. That veil is removed. That veil is removed. Now you can reflect the glory of the Lord like Moses himself. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. The goal is that we become like Christ. We want to become like Christ. I want you to think about this for a second. Just take a second and think about this. Paul is imploring the Corinthian church to understand that we are made right through Christ alone. The law, the whole word of God, and even religious traditions don't make us right with God. Who makes us right with God? Jesus Christ. This helps us to know who God is. This leads us to the Savior. But this book, in and of itself, cannot save you. There's a big difference, right? Is this holy? Does this help me to know God? Yes, it does. Do I love this book? Absolutely. But strict adherence to this book without Christ means nothing. That should blow our minds a little bit. But yes, I love this book. But without him, it means nothing. Our religious traditions, all the traditions that we have, everything that we do, if it doesn't lead to Christ, why do we do it? So what happens next Sunday morning when I show up in my shorts, my t-shirt, and my sandals? Well, and sing five songs, right? Yeah, now we're really going overboard. But think about that. that We have to dress a certain way. Do we? No. We have to meet within a church. No. We choose to meet within a church. Right? Because it helps us to get to know one another, that devoting to fellowship. My question is, if you're not in these walls, protects you yeah, protects you from the weather, right? We'd be getting rained on. But if we're not with believers, somehow, some way, which takes intentionality, we're not devoting ourselves to the fellowship. Whether you do it on Sunday, we do it on Wednesday, you do it on Thursday, you got to be with believers. You want to experience all that God has for you? You want to experience... The glory of the Lord, it's very difficult to do by yourself. Trust me, I'm a loner. I can do it by myself, but I can't do it by myself. I think I can, but God says, no, you need other believers, other believers to, to help you to 
fully understand my, who I am more, right? When I look at everybody in this church, when you look at everybody in this church, can you see Christ in them? Can you see Christ in how they act and what they say and what they do, right? Yeah, I hope so. And, and that's, that's the fact of the matter of who we are, is, is that God himself is most likely, there's a very, 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 very good chance that he's not going to stand right in front of you. Who's going to stand right in front of you? Other believers are going to stand in front of you, and they're going to do what? Reflect the glory of the Lord back to you. So are you reflecting the glory of the Lord right now? I hope so too, right? And that's the thing. What does it take to be able to reflect the glory of the Lord? Faith. Faith. Faith in Christ Jesus. Faith in Christ Jesus. It's that faith, when I believe in him, right? Sometimes it, we have to remind us, I have to go back to like the super basics all the time. I can get caught in adding extra things on top of me to get to God. And Christ is like, no, I made it really easy. Come to me, directly to me. I will change you. I will, you know, as I become more like Christ, as you become more like Christ, we reflect his glory. We become like him. Simply because I let him. When I try to become more, when I try to become more like Christ, what happens? It fails. It fails. It does. And, and, and as we get ready to take communion, I want you to think about that. What's that? Yeah, I want you to walk in. I think it's for the... So as we, as we, even as we do communion, right, the, the thing is, is communion one of those things we do as a church? That is a ritual. Yes, that's the right answer. Communion is a ritual that we do in the church. And when we do this in the church, does communion make us right with God? No, communion doesn't make us right with God. Why do we do communion? In remembrance of him. He just wants us to do something. Hey, he instituted the sacrament. The sacrament we have is, is a ritual that we have, is a religious tradition that we have in the church that we do that brings us to Jesus, to remember him. Do you often forget about Christ? Sometimes we do, right? We get going 100 miles an hour. We can, come on, seriously. Sometimes some of us, unfortunately, put, okay, God, I'm going to put you on the shelf right now. At times we just need to, Set ourselves, remember him. Remember what he has done, right? He not only sacrificed himself so that we could be saved, he sacrificed himself so that we are holy. We are pure. We're blameless. We're right in the eyes of God simply because of what he has done. We forget. Yeah, that's the thing. We get so busy, we forget. But he says, that's, that's one of the things about the sacrament, right? Stop. Just reset your thoughts. Think on me. And even through all the busyness of life, Chuck, we can bring Christ with us. For sure, you know. And it's funny, when, I, when I'm at a meeting and work, I have, a, I have a, a job on top of this, believe it or not. But when I'm in a meeting with a bunch of professionals, and I say something about being a pastor, <laughs> It's interesting how people are like, what? No. Because they, they, don't, they don't expect that. No one expects that in a professional atmosphere. But I'm, at that point, I'm reflecting the glory of the Lord. Right? I'm loving on everybody there. I'm trying to be different. I'm trying to let them know that I am different because of Christ. Not because of what I've done. And just letting people know that I'm a believer, people start conversations with me. I don't have to beat them up. 
I don't have to go, you need Jesus. I just let them know, I, I know Jesus. And then my life reflects his glory. Does it mean I'm flawless? No. But does it mean I'm different? Absolutely. Right? And it's all because of what he's done. As we take a few moments to, to, to remember him, let's remember that God, the Son of God, gave up everything for us. Let's take the, the wafer. The night Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, he gave thanks to God for it, and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's break take this bread together. On the same night, he took the cup. He said, this cup represents my blood. That is shed for you. Do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. Let's take the cup together and remember our Lord. Lord, we can't fully understand and fully appreciate what you gave up so that we could be made right in your sight. Lord, you loved us as we were sinners, as we were spitting in your face and wanting nothing to do with you. You came and made a way so that we can be people that are awesome, people that are restored, people that are redeemed, people that are holy. Lord, we should be in awe. you made us pure, that you made us holy. Lord, and as we, 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 we go about our days and we get so busy, Lord, and we, we get caught up in life, let us take a few moments to just stop, remember you. Let's take a few moments to say, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for what I'm doing right now. Thank you for the ability that you've given me to even be so busy that I do forget about you. But help me to remember you and not to forget about you. But thank you that you allow me to do that even. And Lord, through all of our religious ritualism, help us to remember you. And regardless of what it is, regardless of what we do, even if it's not in Scripture, Lord, that's okay. As long as it leads to you, then it's beneficial for us. And help us just to remember you in everything that we do. And as we give you glory, help us be thankful that we reflect your glory because you're in us. In your name we pray, amen. We have potluck after service. Everybody's welcome. We have plenty of food. If not, God can take five fish, two loaves, and multiply it, so we have plenty of food, yes. Father, I want to thank you for the food.